Welcome to and thank you for joining us today for the Tea Time Talks. Uh, today's talk is the Dublin Markets, given by Gillian Ryan, who has long connections with the uh, the Dublin Markets. And uh, Tea Time's Talks is a series of talks inspired by the history and people of 14 Henrietta Street here in Dublin One. Uh, it tells us tell, uh, 14 10 Henrietta Street tells the story of a house from Georgian beginnings until Tenement times. It's run by Dublin City Council Cultural Company, and it's a uh, run for on behalf of the people of Dublin. Uh, my name is Pat Gary, and in a few minutes I'm going to hand you over to our guest speaker here this evening. Uh, but before I do, I want to let you know that if you have any questions, there's a Q&A box at the end of your screen, and just type in the questions. And at the end of Gillian's talk, we'll do our best to answer all the questions that you've uh, asked here today. So as I said, our speaker today is uh, uh, Gillian Ryan. Uh, she's also a guide in Henrietta Street, one of the best guides that we have down there. So I hope all of you enjoy her talk here this evening. So over to you now, Gillian, please. Hello, everybody. Um, hope you are all nice and cosy and settled in. Um, as Pat said, my name is Gillian Ryan and I'm a tour guide with 40 in Henrietta Street. Um, and when our doors were open in Henrietta Street, I was lucky enough to meet a lot of people um, coming in to, to visit the museum. And I was lucky enough to hear their stories and their memories. And so many people will bring up um, the Dublin markets, whether it be their grannies, our great grannies uh, sold there, or whether they have memories of going in um, with their mothers to do a bit of shopping on a Saturday afternoon. Um, but all of these people spoke with great fondness um, and with a great sense of Dublin pride. So I just want to take you back to where it all began. And that would be back to um, Viking Dublin. Um, so I've just got a few pictures here to show you as well. So this is a, this is one of the oldest maps um, of Dublin. And just where my cursor is here is the outlining of the city walls. So this is the first kind of part of Dublin, which was known as Dublinia. Um, and just where my cursor is here, this is kind of where uh, Dublin City Council sits today. So this would have been uh, one of the biggest uh, trading ports in Europe um, when the Vikings established um, the market areas. Um, um, the River Liffey was known as the River Rorschach, which is a um, tempestuous river, and it would have been a lot bigger than the Liffey that we see today. Um, now, in this area, there's actually three streets that uh, still have the same name as they had back then. So we have um, Fish Amble Street, we have Cook Street, and we have Wine Tavern Street. Um, and basically, the name says it all. So Fish Amble Street um, would have sold fish. Um, the word shambles, so I, I was under the impression that fish shambles, that the street was in um, kind of disarray. Um, and it turns out after talking, we're actually Pat there yesterday, we discovered that the word shambles actually means market or shelf on a market. So it, that gives you an idea of why we actually use that word today. And even though it was a, a street for selling fish, it was actually illegal to go fish on this street. And most of the, the fish that would have been caught and gutted um, and smoked was actually done over the north side of Dublin. So just over this way, you would have had St Mary's Abbey. And the monks had the rights, the fishing rights um, over that side. And there's archaeological evidence along here um, of smoking pits and fish bones and everything else like that. So that kind of gives the name of um, Fish Amble Street. Cook Street uh, was one of the streets that was outside uh, the city walls. And this was because a lot of the buildings in Dublinia at the time were made of wooden structures. So it, it was said that if you were if they were cook in the field, they could burn the whole city down. So, the, so Cook Street was actually placed outside um, the city walls of Dublin. And we also have Wine Tavern Street, which also still has the same name. And the name says it all as well. So that's where you'd go to, uh, to get your wine. And um, there was a lot of taverns down there. And I do know that it's written that if any of the students from Trinity College um, were caught drinking in Wine Tavern Street, that there was a chance that they could be expelled as well. So it was kind of a, a no-go area at the time. Um, a lot of the stalls that were down there, th what they would have sold back in Viking and medieval Dublin was, was really different to what we would buy now on a market stall. For example, um, one of the biggest... Um, one of the biggest trades that we had here in Dublin was actually the slave trade. And one of the most famous slaves to be sold was actually St. Patrick himself. Um, if you walked around the market in medieval Dublin as well, you'd come across stalls like um, 
a scribe, a herbalist, um, the barber surgeon. So, for example, a herbalist would have sold. Uh, so for women um, in that were pregnant, uh, they would go down to the herbalist and they would buy little bags of coriander. And this coriander would be placed on top of the woman's leg during childbirth. And it was supposed to ease uh, birthing pains. Um, I don't think that works. Um, and also dandelions. So dandelions were used um, supposedly to cure stupidity or idiocy. Now, I wouldn't try that at home because my ma gave it to me two brothers and, and it didn't work, so I wouldn't bother. And also you would have had the scribes as well. So you could go down if you needed anything that to be written out for you. Uh, the monks had a stall where they would um, they would write everything down for you. Um, also, you could get, if you had any health issues, you could get um, like ulcers in the mouth or anything like that. You could go down and you could buy a poultice. So that's actually still used um, today. A lot of people will actually still, where they'll wet a piece of bread and put it into where the infection is. And the yeast from the bread will actually draw out the infection. If that didn't work, then you could go to the barber surgeon. So that's where you could get, you could go in and say, I'll have a sharp back and sides and you can pull me two front teeth out while you're at it. Now, if you go by any barbers today, you'll see the red and white twirly thing outside. And this goes right back to medieval times when the barber surgeon would take um, their hanky that was full of blood and dry it on the side of a stall and it would wave in the wind and you'd have that red and white um, kind of effect going around. So that, that's a sign that's still um, used by uh, barbers today. Um, so the monks on the north side kind of smoking the fish and, and gutting the fish that would have went on to the 1500s up until the dissolution of the monasteries. So that's when everything kind of over that way came to, to a head. Um, and Dublin itself would have started to expand. So people started to move outside um, of the city walls and kind of establishing places on the north side um, as well. Um, and not to forget the people on the south side, just in case they think I'm forgetting all about them. There was a lot of market areas and, and names up around uh, that way. So you have Core Market, you have New Market, you would have markets up around uh, Thomas Street, Francis Street, Hawkers and Traders. So they, they, there's a big market culture um, over the south side as well. And as I said, it would have um, expanded rapidly. Um, and just one of these market areas would be the ivy markets. So the ivy markets um, was is was kind of like a, if you walk down, say, is, I think it's Francis Street and John Dillon Street, and automatically are hit with these gorgeous red brick Edwardian buildings. So um, in the year, I'll just hang on one second. So uh, today that market is um, closed, but, uh, Lord Ivy, um, one of the Guinness family, he would have saw all the all the, the hawkers and the traders out on the street in all sorts of weather, um, and some of like anyone that was selling clothes or anything like that it was it was their 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 stuff would be destroyed by by the rain and, and and everything else. So they got their own big lovely indoor market anyway. So that was open from 1906, and then it shut its doors then in the year 2000. So it consisted of a wet market and a dry market. So your wet market was um, your food and your fish and your dry market was like furniture and, and clothes and stuff like that. And as I said, Dublin um, began to get bigger, not only on the south side, but on the north side as well. Um, and if you by the 16 by 1600s, um, after the dissolution of the monasteries, the people were in the walled city of Dublin. Um, it was very compact place. They started to actually give out about the smell, particularly the smell of the fish that was coming in. And um, it, it wasn't, it, it wouldn't have been a clean place. Um, it would have been a filthy, dirty place. And people started to get sick of this. So um, basically the fish sellers and all and the whole lot, we all got thrown over to the north side. So in 1685, then we have uh, the Ormond markets. So the Ormond market was established and it was, it was built specifically for a market. So it was built in a circular kind of structure um, with a lot of side lanes and rows off it. Um, and, and the market, there was also an indoor market as well where a lot of uh, people would have um, purchased their products to sell on the markets. And these were also 
it, people also would have come up from the likes of uh, Smithfield and um, there would have been uh, the Rotunda Market, Norfolk, Norfolk Market. So these kind of markets were well established on the north side um, at this stage. Um, so, but the, the thing about the, the almond market was it wasn't regulated. So there wasn't much revenue being generated out of these markets. It was just kind of, it was a quick decision to kind of get everybody out of the south side over, over to the north side. So then we have, um, so we have actually Luke Gardner and then kind of hitting the 1700s and you have with the White Streets Commission coming in and Luke Gardner building up all these uh, Georgian townhouses um, in Georgian Dublin. And that would give the markets a huge boost. Um, and also uh, rents in small shops began to rise. So a lot of people then ventured out of their shops and would have gone into the laneways um, and streets surrounding Moore Street. Like you would have had uh, Coles Lane, Denmark Street, Norfolk Street, Riddles Row, Horseman's Row, Sampson's Lane, all of these places, all these little alleyways, um, all with, with sellers on them. Um, I just want, because of all these uh, rich people that were um, now settled in the city and particularly over the north side, and an example I'm going to use is actually 40 in Henrietta Street. So if you had a stall and bef if you had a stall, say, let's say on Moore Street, and you were the Molesworth family had gone down and bought stuff off your stall. So Mary Molesworth decided that she was going to buy from your stall. Um, when she bought from your stall, you could actually advertise that. Um, and that would give that would that be like your stall going from Aldi to Marks and Spencer's because people would be saying, well, if Mary Molesworth is buying off her, I'm going to buy off her. If it's good enough for her, it's good enough for me. I very much keep up with the Joneses. So, um, and the markets would have been also uh, very busy places in the winter time because the, in Georgian Dublin they only use the Georgian dwellings for um, for the winter time. So this was kind of party season. This was the dinners. This was the dances. So the people that walked on the stalls would have got a, a lot of business um, over over the winter. Um, and. I'm going to take us up then um, to kind of in around the mark. So I just want to kind of talk a little bit about um, when the almond market again, because when the almond market, as I said, it wasn't regulated. So the Dublin Corporation decided to build, it was also filthy dirty as well. So they decided to build the market, the, the indoor market down, down there on Green Street. So that was in the in the 1800s. And this had three kind of ventilation. Julie, uh, do you want to move on the map? Yeah. So we're slide, yeah. over here. Forgot all about that. And I was enjoying yeah. looking at that. Look, there's <laughs> this Lord Ivy. And that, that's kind of just giving the example of the Edwardian red brick houses as well. <laughs> Fish Amble Street. Um, so just to, yeah, as about the, the almond market. Um, it wasn't regulated. It was filthy dirty. Um, and they built one down in Green Street. So there was three ventilation uh, kind of pieces in it, and it was also north facing. So this would keep all the the fruit and vegetables cool, even in even in the middle of the summer. Um, and it was also regulated by du uh, Dublin Corporation, so they were getting they were getting taxes and stuff like that. Um, and the mayor of Dublin then would uh, went down and decided to regulate all of the markets. So they had what they'd send, what was down um, mystery shoppers. So if you had a weighing scales and you were selling, let's say gooseberries, and you were adding a little bit on, um, the mystery shopper would cop this and you'd be fined five shillings. And that was over a hundred years ago. That was in the 1890s. So that would have been um, a lot of money um, at the time. Um, and uh, in 1873, for example, a street trader called Esther Hart, she was fined five shillings for messing with our weighing scales. Um, it was illegal to trade um, on a Sunday. And we have those kind of documents here. A man called uh, Thomas Mooney from Riddles Row. He was charged with, with that offence as well. Um, and failure, if you got caught again for messing with your weighing scales, your weighing scales would be confiscated off you altogether. 
Um, so to kind of bring us back then to, uh, I want to take us up um, to, to kind of talk about Moore Street as well in, in, 1960, in 1916. Moore Street is not only famous for the stalls and, and the market traders as well, but it's also famous for being um, a battle site. Um, and they've got a lot of, that, that's got a lot of kind of publicity about it. But what you don't hear an awful lot is what it was like for the people that actually lived on the street. Um, oh, yeah. In 1916, 17 civilian bodies would have lay dead on that street for over a week. Um, there's a lot of start, uh, people that kind of gave their accounts, especially when they were looking for them, um, when they were putting in insurance claims and all, telling their stories. Um, and there were stories of um, ceasefires being held to let people out of the houses. Um, and it was known that if seven people ran out of one house, the chances are that only five of them um, hit the corner. Um, even people that were afraid to come out of their houses at the time in, in around that area, there's evidence of people that uh, getting hit by stray bullets um, through their windows. And one of the stories that stands out for me is a woman that she lived up the top, up the Henry Street end of Moore Street, and all our neighbours were in with, with their kids. And they, after a couple of days, they'd ran out of food. So a lot of people were starving. So she got a white pillowcase and she waved it at the British soldiers because what they had done was they had got the butcher's blocks out of the shops and they had barricaded the street off. So she was looking right out at this and she waved a white pillowcase out at them and called one of the soldiers over. And she said, did you see that bakery over there? She said, I want you to smash the window. She said, and I want you to fill up that bread. And he said to her, um, and where's your, um, where's your be of a husband? And she said, where should you be? Or where you should be? And he said, and where's that man? She said, over fighting in France, he's a soldier. And he just looked at her and he said, okay. And he went over and smashed the window and he took the bread out for her and gave her the bread. Um, there was also a story of a woman that was there as well. And she, she sent her husband out to the back garden to kind of run out. I don't know what he was getting. Um, she, she never said, but she actually watched him hit a, a stray bullet. And she had to look at his body lying there for a week. And there was those heroic stories of people um, that saw people getting shot on the street as well and ran out and kind of pulled them away up to and um, got them up to Jervis Street Hospital. So that's kind of the scene that was in in around Moore Street at that time. And when I talked to a lot of people, as I said, people, a lot of people come in and out of Henrietta Street telling their stories. And one of the one thing they always say that stands out for me in particular is they say, Oh, my granny or my great granny, she she hid letters for Pierce in our bloomers. So she hid guns or weapons in our bloomers and she she was great and fair play to them. But I always kind of look at them with a smile and I always kind of think to myself, well, more than likely my great granny was throwing rotten vegetables at them because I don't think for one minute that she was hiding letters in our bloomers. And there was a good reason for that. Um, because just after the rising, not a lot of people had sympathy. Um, because if you think about it, and especially the women that were on Moore Street um, and the market areas, they were getting, uh, most of their husbands would have been off fighting in World War I. And these women were getting what was known as a separation allowance. And they were in fear of actually losing that allowance because of uh, what went on. And you also have the fact as well that a lot of these people had seen their friends and their family um, being killed. And a lot of their, their, uh, their fruit and their vegetables and all, the, all their stuff had gone to waste and had all gone rotten. And as we all know, um, people didn't actually sympathise with the leaders of the Rising until the stories came out about James Connolly being shot in a chair and Joseph Plunkett only getting 15 minutes with Grace Gifford. And that kind of... Um, made people sympathise with them. And you can see that kind of in the years later of people coming back from World War I and kind of joining in with them. So that kind of sets the scene for me um, for Moore Street and the 1916 Rising. Um, and I just want to as well bring you up to um, World War II. Okay, World so War II. Oh, just before I move on to World War II, actually, I just want to share this, this with you. 
This is Henry Moore, Earl of Drogheda. And I always say to people, this is the man who has four streets in Dublin named after him. So before the Wide Streets Commission, um, O'Connell Street was called Drogheda Street. So we have Drogheda Street, Sackville Street and O'Connell Street. Um, so you look at it here, Henry Street, Moore Street, North Dale Street and Drogheda Street. So that's the four streets there. And there's a picture of them, that, well, kind of a painting of them there. Um, just if you want to know who Moore Street is uh, named after. And these are the markets that uh, just recently shut down, the markets in Green Street and um, Mary's Lane there. And if you're ever walking by, have a look, because you look at the the kind of architecture of the building and you'll see all the fruit, the fruit and veg going along. It's a beautiful building to actually stop and look at. And there's a lot to look at on it. And this is, um, just to go back to 1916, this is kind of some of the destruction that people from that time would have seen. So their, their whole uh, livelihood gone and um, kind of um, that's the way it was. This is actually a great story. And this is one of Pat's stories. So um, just on this building up at the top, Pat, would you actually like to tell this story for a second? Will you tell this story for me for a second? Because it's your auntie's story. You just take your sound off. Sorry about this uh, thing. But this is the story. It's number five, uh, Moore Street. And in before, just before 1916, it was a Mr. James Canavan. He had his business there. He was a butcher. And a well-known butcher, well-respected butcher. And above the butcher shop, he lived there with his wife, the housekeeper, and his 11-year-old granddaughter. And it so happened that uh, his building, his original building, was completely destroyed in 1916. And he wasn't a very happy man. Now, he had happened, he was trapped in there for a while, managed to escape to his son's house. <coughs> excuse me. And uh, when he came back, a few days after rising and he saw the stage of the building it was just a pile of stones and uh, charred wood he just took to the bed his nerves were shattered and uh, he there was a, a uh, the property losses commission property loss commission was set up and the closing date for applications for loss of property was the 15th of august but unfortunately mr canavan was just so upset he didn't get his uh, application in until the november by which time it was too late so Mr. Canavan wasn't at all happy. And uh, when he was recreating the building, he had a few bob. Uh, he did a few things. He put up the dragon. And that's the dragon there. Anybody look up there, it's to keep an eye on everybody that's gone by and to ward away all sorts of evil there. And if you look down below the dragon, it's just here on the uh, screen there. You can see this is Mr. supposedly Mr. Canavan. And Mr. Canavan is shown there. And he's absolutely disgusted with what happened after 1916. So when you go there and you see that, you get some idea. And I heard that recently off an aunt of mine. She'll be 100 now in November. And uh, she knew the family. And she pointed out that that was Mr. Canavan there, letting everybody know how unhappy he was, what happened with 1916. So there's that story there now, Julia. Thanks very much, Pat, for telling us that. I love that story. Yeah. Um, just, I want to take this, I want to talk about... Um, what it was like in uh, in the markets during World War Two. Um, it was actually a very interesting time because we wouldn't have called it, or the people back then wouldn't have called it uh, the Second World War. In in Ireland, it was known as the emergency, and um, it was a little bit of an emergency because not only was that going on, but we also had um, the corporation strike going on in the market areas. So none of the rubbish was being collected so if you can imagine how smelly that was and how built up that was and what it was like for for the traders that was actually down there I keep going to say the word dealer but you can't really say my granny was a dealer anymore because it doesn't mean now what it did back then um so the um so it was full of rubbish and everything like that with the corporation strike which was which kind of came in quite handy around that area in world war ii because um, none of, a lot of produce wasn't coming into the country with the with the ships fighting out at sea and everything. Not a lot of stuff could actually get in. And one of the things that couldn't get in as well that was being imported into Ireland was the rats. So the Royal College of Surgeons used to import rats in and to dissect them for the for the medical students. So because these weren't coming in and there was a corporation strike, 
the Royal College of Surgeons came down and gave uh, people that wanted one, they gave them a cage. Um, and for every rat that you caught was worth truppence. And I think that was the equivalent to two pints of porter at the time. So you can just you can see that picture of rubbish piling up everywhere and people running around with cages and um, catching rats at the time as well. And also as well, um, you would have had uh, a lot of rations. So not a lot of fish was being sold at the time either. So if you wanted to get fish for any reason at all, the best thing you could do was actually go out and try and catch it yourself because none of the trawlers were going out. So that was um, that was kind of a, a lot of hardship on, on the, the dealers that were dealing fish at the time as well. Um, and also as well, what I find fascinating is during World War II, a, a lot of the toys that would have been sold around the area as well were actually made by German soldiers that were captured and put up to the curry. So they used to carve out, they used to make wooden boats and wooden airplanes. And these would, in turn would be um, given to the soldiers for uh, cigarettes, for, for money for cigarettes or money for alcohol and stuff like that. And then in turn, then these would be sold on the markets down. So I actually think that's actually quite fascinating that you kind of like in the middle of a war and the, the kids playing with, with, with toys that the soldiers had uh, had taken. Um, and there was also signs all around the place. So what you could do was, was you could go into one of the butchers and you could buy uh, some meat. So if you had family living over over in England or anything like that, you could actually buy some meat in the butchers and the butchers would send it over then. So a lot of people were going in and there'd be signs everywhere saying, um, help, help our friends in England or give a donation to try and get some food um, over to them. So that's just a little couple of stories there on the... Uh, around the markets in World War II. But I want to kind of just set the scene for you for a moment. Um, just, so this, just going back here. So this is, this is photograph is Coles Lane. So it's giving you an idea. And you can see a lot of the kids here as well don't have um, any shoes on them. And I'm gonna go into that in a minute. I'm just gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, but I just want to show you these photographs for, so you can, even though that's probably on a clean day, you can see the rubbish kind of piled around. And I know this was taken in around World War II as well, this, this photograph here. And just some of the sellers. And I know they're cheeky Charlies, I've heard of them. Don't know whether any, anybody remembers them or not. And then, so I just, I'm just gonna go back to this picture here. So I, folks, what I want to do now is I want just to just take a look at that picture. And I want you to imagine it for a moment. Um, so this picture here was taken in 1914. And, and I'm going to set the scene for you um, of what it was actually like. So at five o'clock in the morning, you'd see all the traders um, around Moore Street and surrounding areas coming out of their tenements. Um, a lot of them would go up to uh, the, the local churches, Dominic Street Church and surrounding churches, and get a quick mass that morning before they went out down to the Green Street Market with their prams, their old prams and um, their hand carts um, and load up their produce for the day. And you'd see all the horses and the men with the horses and carts all around there loading everything up um, to bring it back down to Moore Street. Um, at seven o'clock, you'd see all the stalls um, set up um, and you'd hear the sound of the animals um, being brought down. And now, even though Smithfield was the, the kind of the farmer's uh, the farmers market where they sold all the animals animals and all there was over 80 obituary or uh, abattoirs sorry in around this area so you can imagine the feces and everything else that was around and they say that animals can sense when they're going to the abattoir so there was a lot of animals actually trying to get away from the doors of these buildings um so you can just picture all that um we've come to romanticize a lot about our ancestors and we've come to um we've come to see it as 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 this fantastic um place um but it was far from a fantastic place at the time and um, because at the doors of those abattoirs you've also would have seen in the shadow you also would have seen women and children kind of hiding at the corner waiting for a bit of offal to fall on the ground so maybe they could grab it and take it home for that bit of dinner um, you might also think that woman that's on the stall with two 
children wrapped in shawls around her, standing in the pouring rain, selling her fruit and vegetables. When in reality, she's probably standing there just to put crumbs on the table and, and to pay the money lender. And one of the worst stories for me about that is you see the man going around looking for the banana box, um, looking for something to bury his child in. Um, and they're the real stories of just some of the real stories of, of what the market area was like. It wasn't kind of as romantic as as people um, think it is. Um, and just on that note as well. The end of the story. Um, the end of the story for me on the Dublin markets is when I stand and I look at the Ilac Centre or I stand on either end of Moore Street because nowadays you don't see the sea of the sea of heads. You don't hear the women shouting cheeky Charlies or bananas. Um, you don't hear the children running around. You don't see or hear any of that anymore. Um, before, even before COVID, there was one or two stalls kind of dotted around. So for me, when you stand on either end of Moore Street, that's where the story kind of ends for me. Um, and when COVID is over, hopefully, and you are in, back in town and you are walking around, if you see any of the stalls, whether it be on the north side or it be on the south side, just go out and have a few pennies in your pocket. Go over and, and, and buy something off them and uh, kind of try and keep them going because it, it, it is known, even today, it's known as the, the heart of the heart of Dublin and a lot of people think back on these markets with fond memories so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of we go back to Pat um, and maybe if anybody would like to ask um, some questions I have to say Gillian that was an extremely interesting um, talk uh, I just can't wait to get down to Moore Street and you know what I'm thinking you're describing the atmosphere you know you can go into markets you know supermarkets and places like that but the place to get a real smell of what Dublin was like maybe 100 years ago would be more street like you know so yeah people lament the loss of you know Bewley's and other places you know but if you want to get a real sense of what dublin was like you know 50 or 100 years ago a visit to more street as well worth the uh the chance like you know but the, and the thing about it as well is pat and everybody can relate to it as i said everybody can relate to it whether your ancestors that walked there or your mother got her shopping there everybody has some sort of a memory or some sort of a story from it and most of the people that were from those, uh, that walked those areas, lived in those areas as well. Um, so it was it was such a tight-knit community um, and kind of places where everybody helped each other out. And you hear that story, and I love hearing it because you hear that story when you come into 14 Henrietta Street. And you can imagine them all because they were all kind of walking down in these areas. So walking and living in, in, in the same areas. I'd love to be able to go back. I'd love a time machine. <laughs> and, and to go back and to be able to walk around. I really would. <laughs> Definitely, like, you know. And hopefully now when the, the new vegetable markets are regenerated, you know, there'll be some sort of a market there where people can actually go in and buy food again, like, you know, because uh, one of the slides there that you have, you see the, there's one person selling out side last Christmas. Have you got that slide? I haven't got that one, no. Yeah, there, go down again. The, I don't have it now. on this, now. Okay, but there was a... Uh, uh, last Christmas, I think it was the first year that the fruit and vegetable markets were closed, and there was one go lonely guy outside, and he was selling uh, holly wreaths. You know, I mean, you think for over a hundred years, there would have been hundreds of dealers in there, like you know, selling all their fruit and vegetables, flowers, and things like that, like you know. And then it turns out to one lonely guy outside at Christmas. So that's the story there. So, have you any uh, questions there, or ch questions and answers there? The one thing we'd love to hear from people, if anybody is looking and anybody has any memories of Moore Street, um, we would actually love to hear from you and we'd actually love to to get those memories from you. Because um, if you think about it, if it's nearly gone now in 50, 60 years time, it'll be all gone and we, and we lose all of that. So we're looking to kind of take in as much memories as we, of people's memories as we can, because it's the ordinary people. Well, no, and they're, they're extraordinary people. They're not ordinary, exactly, they're extraordinary. Yeah. There's a question here about when Dublin would have, uh, you know, when the Vikings were here in the slave trade. So it would have, I presume, just a question, I presume it would have been mainly in the uh, in the Viking era. Yeah. That there would have been the, the slave trade yeah. in Dublin, like, you know? So, yeah. 
And it was actually one of the biggest slave trading ports in Europe. And there was at, also at a bottle, time. I think sometime in the 16th century, it was quite legal to sell your wife if you were going to uh, sea. Yeah. You could put it down a skipper's alley, which is between Cook Street and the Liffey. You could have, there was a block there, you could actually put your wife up, auction your wife, and then you'd leave her with somebody else and you'd go off to sea, like, you know, so that was a thing, like, you know. There was actually um, in the 1600s as well, in, and it was in, I know it was in Britain as well, but there was a gin epidemic. So everyone was strung out on gin and people were selling their wives for a bottle of gin. I remember, re- I remember laughing reading that and it was like, it was a, like a pandemic of alcoholics on gin. Yeah. Because it was so easy to make. There's a question here this about this slide, what street is. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's more street, isn't it? And it's um, the reason it's taken during the war and during the war, you didn't have an awful lot of produce there for people. So there wouldn't have been an awful lot of stuff there at the time. And then the next question, thank you, Gillian. Uh, where did you get your information on Esther Hart and who are being oh, the fine for tampering with the scales? Was that in a newspaper report? Was it the I one got that from a scales? book by Barry uh, Kennark, mm-hmm. um, a book, um, the story of the Dublin this Dublin market district, um, about Moor Street. So it has a lot of information about um different uh, sellers. You see, I don't like mentioning anyone's name, just in case, um, do you know what I mean, when you're reading, when you're kind of writing stuff now, because these people, some of these people could still be alive, or their children Mm. could still be alive watching, and you don't want to say that their their granny or their mammy was um, doing people out of a few bombs, do you know what I mean? (laughs) Now, you've answered that, because the other question was the name of a book, and that's about, uh, the book you mentioned there on Moore Street, it's by Richard Kennark, is it? Barry Kennark. Barry Kennark, okay, yeah. and that's that should be available in your local library. I don't think it's available on uh, Amazon or that now, like you know. No, um, chapters is great. Um, for if you're looking for for books around Dublin or Moor Street or anything like that, um, when chapters opens back up, that's a good place to go in. And because some of the books they sell are second hand as well, so you get them cheap and cheerful. Two other questions here, like you know, the fruit and vegetable market closed there recently, there in say Micken Street, and. Uh, Two questions, really. Uh, what's going to happen to those markets, and where exactly have the fruit and vegetable markets gone? So well, the city council does have a plan for the refurbishment of the uh, the fruit and vegetable markets. We know that that's going on. It's stopped now, unfortunately, because of the circumstances. And as to where the fruit markets are gone, there's still a number of providers around there, um, well-known uh, people like you know Keelings and all that still have places. But the city council, I think, wanted to move all of the um, fruit and vegetables out to North County Dublin, where the food is produced out there, like, you know, so they thought they want to move it out there. But if you walk around the fruit markets, you still get the smell of onions and fruits and all that, don't you, down around there, Gillian? And the odd forklift truck. And the odd, more than the odd forklift truck. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, Gillian, this is one for you, okay. Um, super interesting talk, and thank you. Uh, Cheeky Charlie's. Get your Donald Duck, your Mickey Mouse, your Pinocchio and your Cheeky Charlie. What was the Cheeky Charlie? I believe it was a monkey hmm. um, on a string. Yeah, a puppet. Am I right, a, a puppet? puppet? Is a, a Muppet or, yeah, a Muppet, a puppet, is it? Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, it was. It's I'm, only, of... I'm only a young one. Yeah. I... <laughs> 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 yeah it was a sort of a monkey on a, a puppet. Of a monkey, like Pope you know, on that a string. It's only when I've like, seen you know? the odd photograph of a but Yeah. Before I seen, it, I wouldn't have known what it was. Yeah. Uh, there was a talk here. You know the hill North Cumberland Street there, where people oh, Saturday yeah. mornings. That's still going, isn't it? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it was going until fairly recently. I think it is still going. Yeah. yeah. The the tuggers, isn't it? Yeah. Because I know there. I think of a month ago. One of the longest uh, traders there, she died, she was in her 80s. That's right, And yeah. she got her, her uh, there was an article on the front of the Irish Times about her, you know, so that's it. So that's something that's still going on. And uh, records of fines imposed on people, I presume that would be in the newspapers and court reports at the time, wouldn't it? Yeah, because um, you'd get all the court reports and find my past 
um, and ancestry. Um, like if you had any um, relations that were that were traders or anything like that, you could put their name in. And if they did do that and untowards, um, the newspaper article will will come up. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of documented. As I said, because it was regulated, it was regulated by the Lord Mayor of, of Dublin. So he met, he went around to make sure everything was legit because up in the almond market, it wasn't legit. It was, it was pretty much a free for all up there. Um, and it would have been a filthy, dirty place as well. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to change all that. They wanted to make it a cleaner place. They wanted to regulate it and make sure that people weren't getting um, ripped off. And you have to understand as well, there was a lot, as I said, the gentry and all, they didn't, even though they had plenty of money, they didn't want to be, ripped off either so and there's another question there have all the markets gone you know I mean um, fruit and vegetable is gone the daisy market is gone we think the hill is still there the ivy market the Guinness family are trying to get it back and they want to restore it and reopen as a market I don't um, know. a lot of them are gone there's still a few stalls left um, on Moore Street, and there's still some stalls over on Thomas Street as well. So yeah. So the stalls, just there's still street traders dotted around the place, but it, it's nothing like I think we're one of the only European cities that doesn't have a big market area anymore. Mm. Um, and I know that's going to change in time, but no, it's it's just with the buildings of the, all the shopping centres and everything, nobody kind of really ventures into town for their fruit and vegetables anymore. So there's no really need, unless it's a farmer's market now, unless they mm. kind of do it in a way that meets today's standards, like put cafes in or outdoor eating or, you know, uh, food samples, like cooking food, you know, kind of make it more cosmopolitan now than just going in and, and buying off a stall because it, times have changed. But as I said, we're the only European city that doesn't seem to have one of those market areas. Yeah, if you go to Amsterdam or any of these places, there's huge areas laid out for markets. Practically every neighbourhood has yeah. its own street market. Like, you know, even in London, you know, they still have the street markets. Uh, more praise for you, um, thing. Uh, Gillian. Full of praise, actually, here. Like, you know, uh, thing. and then the question, do traders, they have a street licence, don't they? And are they inherited within families? They did have, you did have a, a licence to trade. Um and it was it was the type of license that could be passed down from generation to generation. Um, so if you talk to any of the, the traders on Moore Street in recent years, the chances are that mothers, they got the, the license off their mothers and they got their, the license off their mothers. So it was something that's passed down. And trading, street trading was, it was basically all a lot of people had. Because if you go back even on genealogy and you look at, what your ancestors done. One of my ancestors was a rag picker and I didn't know what that was at the time. And when I looked into it, it was, it was like that again, it was a street trader who would get old clothes um, do them up and then sell them on a stall. So that was, that was a rag picker. And then you have, I've other ancestors that were peddlers. It <laughs> mean different things today, but, yeah. but peddlers. So like the, the, the rag and ball men. So, everyone had kind of was selling something years ago um, because nobody could, very few people could afford to rent out a shop. And the other thing, it's hard work. I mean, you look at it, it looks very picturesque in the photographs and all that, and the women look always happy. But you're out there in hail, rain and snow, you know, and it's really tough. And whatever you're selling, it's all perishable goods. So you have to sell them as quickly as you possibly can on the days like you know so that's uh Shem you know you put in long days that's why you'd be there from early in the morning to late in the evening my dad was telling me um there a couple of weeks ago and he was telling me that every friday night his granny would call him and my uncle michael up up to her up to her room and they'd have to sit there every friday friday night shelling peas into a big tin basin and and to be washed and to be sold then on the saturday morning i i, I just think that's brilliant I, I love that. And I was like, oh, geez, I'd love to be able to do that. Yeah, it was... Uh, it was like, it wasn't that much fun. I remember the certain restaurants used to come in, the dealers used to cut the heads off the um, 
the fish like you know but certain hotels them and use them for a stock pot like you know it's a thing like you know we just discard them but other people had a value on them as well like it was a thing there's a question here how did the slave trade work i know it's a bit off and uh, and who were the slaves but I, I just remember a few years ago we were in iceland and um they were talking there about the dna of the people there and there's a very strong irish element over there because an awful lot of irish women were taken over to uh, iceland by the vikings as slaves so you've got a huge uh, thing and an awful lot of Scandinavian countries. And I believe that the the Vikings actually went of, around as far as Corsica with Irish women, like, you know, to uh, populate these areas and that, like, you know. So that's the way it would have won there. Uh, and then uh, somebody watching from Florida, you've got an international audience here. Uh, oh, Jane, hello. Like you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? It, as well, it was, it was grab anyone. Yeah. It was grab anyone and, and shackle them and bring them back and sell them. Um, so that that's the way it worked. Yeah. It wasn't, a, it wasn't any, it was, again, with the Vikings, it was Garanya boat. I mean, Vikings mean sea pirate. Mm. So they were pirates as well. And then, uh, this is their last, it's a comment really, and to remember Tony Gregory, Gregory who went to jail while he was a TD defending street traders. And I think we have to be very grateful to him, don't we? Oh God, yeah. That was 1985. Um, was something to do with the licenses, wasn't it? It was yeah. they were, or they wouldn't let them sell on Henry Street. People that had sold there for years and years, um, and and licenses were being revoked. Fair play to, fair play to him as well. There was yeah. a lot of them. Um, there was a lot of that documented as well about Tony Gregory and what happened in 1985. So if anybody is interested in that. To go and have a look as well. Yeah. Look into it. And here's another comment from a person who lives near, near Nottingham. They say Nottingham and Leicester in the UK, they're both big cities and they still have lively and vibrant markets, like, you know. And uh, somebody says, court records on find my past and ancestry. Uh, some wouldn't have been in the papers, but there are court reports that you can go and visit here, like, you know, they should be all be available in the National Archives. So, uh, that's it, Gillian. I'd like to thank you for your talk here today. Uh, it's been well received. There's a huge amount of praise. Uh, so uh, just to thank you for your talk here today and to thank you all for listening here this evening. Thank you again. Thanks very much, everybody, for listening. Enjoy our evening. <laughs>